Okay, uh, well, thank you for coming. Uh, I will try to speak slowly. Now, I was told that this community was uh, cryptography focused. <laughs> um, so I've prepared a little bit more cryptography than usual. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if it's too much, you know, we can skip that part a little bit more than expected, let's say. Okay? Yeah. Um, but we'll start easy. So anyway, but uh, so this is our agenda. As we might do a little bit less on the crypto side. <laughs> um, but let's first start with, you know, what's the kind of problem we're trying to solve here? And so in 1971, an American think tank, you know, government advisory group called RAND, uh, you might have heard of RAND, I don't know if it's famous here. Yeah, yeah it's very uh, famous. They were asked, so suppose you were, you know, an advisor to the KGB. Now, no, these were the bad Russian guys, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and you were given the assignment of designing a system for the surveillance of all citizens and visitors within the boundaries of the, well, USSR at the time. Mm -hmm. It should not be too obtrusive or obvious. How would you do it? Any idea what they proposed? No. 1971. Yeah. Wow. Well, they basically invented credit cards at the time. What is RAND? Oh? A think tank. Lande. Government advisory group. Lande oh. Oh. So they, they basically at the time proposed credit cards. Oh. Because that's the way to track you wherever you go, you need to spend stuff, we can see you. Yeah. And you just it's indirect, but it's still tied to your identity. And a couple of years, well, a couple of decades later, Mr. Snowden, I assume you remember his name, yeah. right? he said at the IETF meeting in 2015, of course not in person, it was a bit <laughs> difficult for him to attend in person, uh, he said, I think one of the big things that we need to do is we need to get rid away from true name payments on the internet. The credit card payment system is one of the worst things that has happened for the user in terms of being able to divorce their access to energy. By the way, Mr. Snowden had a lot of bad news for us in terms of privacy on the internet, right? <laughs> and this is one of the worst things? What have we done about it since then? And we started doing HTTPS everywhere. Uh -huh, you know, yeah. some people started to encrypt all of their messengers. Yeah. Right? And what are you doing with the payments? Uh -huh. Nothing. Right? Uh -huh. Now, there are some people that are doing things, and uh, this includes uh, the, the Chinese government, yep. uh, actually both Chinese governments, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> Chinese <laughs> community <laughs> governments. So uh, they are building what's called a central bank digital currency. Have you heard about that? Yeah. yeah. Right? The idea that the central bank runs the payment system and that you pay directly in money uh, issued by the central bank also digitally. They're still, right. wrong. They're still developing that. And it's not really now yet. They're still developing that, and there's basically two main variants. Yeah. One is what they call wholesale CBDC, which is for between banks. Yeah. And that's kind of what has existed for a long time. Um, and what they're now doing, uh, or working on, some of, at least some of them, is what's called retail central bank digital currency, mm -hmm. where it's really the final users using it. Yeah. Right? And. Uh, but mainland China has one of the largest deployments of a retail CBDC out there. Um, I just giving the government lots of brilliant insights uh, into the population. And of course, if they don't like you, they can just turn off your access, right? And now, you are a bit far away, but have you heard of the Bank of International Settlements? You know what those guys are? Bank of International Settlements? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's basically what you could think of as like the United Nations of the central banks, uh -huh. right? So they are were created to kind of have a forum for central banks to do their research. And I want to play you a quick video uh -huh. on how the head of the Bank of the International uh, Bank of the International Settlements, how he views CBDC with respect to cash. Mm -hmm. So he's comparing those two things. And, uh, please listen. It's, uh, I can't slow him down. Or how the analysis is CBDC in particular for, for the use of general, 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 to the general, general use, use. Uh, we, we tend, tend to, to establish, establish the equivalences with hash. hash. And, and, and there is a few differences there. Uh, for example, some in cash, cash uh, we don't know, for example, some who's using, using a one one hundred dollar bill they don't know, know, know who is using one thousand cents of bill they pay. The key difference in the CBDC 
is the central bank will have absolute control on on the personal relations that the government induces of that expression of central bank liability, and also so we will have the technology to enforce that. Those are some also issues. Okay, I'm afraid the echo is very horrible. But I hope you heard the key difference between central bank digital currency and cash is that the central bank will have absolute control. Oh, you know, that's the key difference, absolute control. Um, not the most popular thing amongst free software supporters usually is for somebody else to have absolute control. Um, so uh, that brings us to what could the alternatives be, right? How should we pay on the internet in the future? So uh, we started the Tata project almost a decade ago, and it's uh, been growing slowly but steadily ever since. And I want to start by saying Tata is not a cryptocurrency. <laughs> it's a payment system, a payment system infrastructure project with lots of components because you want to have something at once with the payer, something at once at the bank, something at once at the merchant. Mm -hmm. So you have all of these components that have to work together using protocols, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is a company that wants to deploy, but it's also GNU Tyler. It's a GNU package. It is free software, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the main goal of everybody is to deploy this as widely as possible. Again, main things, it's not a currency. Mm -hmm. You can pay in Taiwanese dollars, you can pay in euros, you can pay in dollars in the end, right? Or you can pay in Bitcoin. We're not, you're not, can't pay in Taler, it's not a currency. You can pay with Taler as a protocol, mm -hmm. right? So, most important distinction. So it's also not useful for storing value. You're not supposed to keep your savings in there. It's more like digital cash for you, right? Um, it doesn't earn interest. There's no reason for you to keep you know, millions or, uh, in, in, in your wallets. Um, it's not an instance of a system or payment network like there is uh, uh, PayPal, for example. Oh. Right? It's more like a protocol like HTTP. Oh. And there can be many operators that are offering it. Right? As long as they're using the same standard, you know, we can talk to them with the same software. But there's not one person offering it in the end. Right? Now, of course, if a central bank decides to offer it, they might legally say nobody else may offer it in this country. Right? But that's in a political choice. Right? The technology is, you know, we assume somebody who is a regulated, licensed bank is offering it. It's not decentralized as an architecture. You know, we've been talking about central banks. I always find it very funny if central banks decide let's go for the blockchains because, you know, they will allow us to decentralize. You know, it seems a bit strange to, you know, use blockchains for decentralization when you are called a central bank. Mm -hmm. um, now, it doesn't have to be operated by the central bank. You can also do it as a federated system, as commercial banks. Right? Um, there's one thing that is decentralized, which is the data. Your data and your money is under your control on your computer. There's a, an operator that we can identify. Right? Uh, the, the, the data is kept decentralized. What is some of it? And last but not least, there is no proof of work, no proof of stake. No burning down the planet to do five transactions per second. You know, this is an efficient system, not like the blockchains. Now, when we started the project, we actually started not with, okay, let's write some code, or here's some cryptography, but we said, what do we want to build here? We started with some design goals. And I would always advise you, if you start a big project, first say, what do you actually want to achieve? And prioritize. So these are in order of priority. And if you change the priorities, you will get a different design. Right? So, and the first priority was to say, it has to be implemented as free software. Mm -hmm. So, no hardware. You know, there are hardware solutions for payments. Right? We wanted a software solution. Right? And it should be free software, nothing proprietary where we can go and say, ah, oh, it's all secret, don't look at it. Right? Anybody should, was supposed to be able to, well, hack it, change their code. You know, if you want to customize your wallet, go for it. That shouldn't break the security assumptions of the system. You know. So second goal is that if I if I'm buying something, I should have the best privacy we can have. 
complete anonymity for the person spending money, but only for the person who's spending money, not for the person who is receiving money. That's the third goal. If you receive money, if you earn, it's usually socially considered a good thing, earning money, right? At least if you do it legally, right? Then you should be able to declare your well, should be required to declare your taxes, pay your taxes, and make it a legal business. And the government should be able to see, okay, you earned this much. This means you have to pay this much in taxes. What did you earn it for? Was it a legal business or was it selling drugs or weapons? Right? And if it's an illegal business, they should be able to stop you. Right? And they have no privacy if you receive money. Now this is for some people very unusual, this idea of, wait, 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 I can have one person be anonymous who's spending and the other person completely transparent? Yes, with cryptography you can do that. Right? We always think about, oh, with the credit card system, both sides are transparent. You know, the government knows who is spending money and who is receiving it. And with cash, physical cash, both sides have good privacy. Right? Here the goal was to make it asymmetric. You spend money, you have best privacy. You know, what newspapers you buy, what books you read, what doctors you visit, which trains you take. It's your personal thing. Nobody else needs to know. Right? But when you're a business, you're earning money, yep, then society can see. Now, who in society, whether it's just the bank, the central bank, the tax office, you know, we can decide that. You know, the payment service providers will have the initial point saying, okay, you got money. Now, who do we share this with? That's society's choice. But you can't choose to say, oh, no, no, I didn't get any money. No, this is obvious to some entity mm -hmm. that we can hold accountable for disclosing the information where necessary. Okay, now it's a payment system, so we also, of course, want to not have payment fraud, right? Mm -hmm. This is already number four down on the list. Then we go, why, why is this not higher? Well, again, if you found a way to protect fraud, but that would break the privacy of people, mm -hmm. we wouldn't want that, right? So now, five, if we have achieved the first four goals, then in all other respects, we also want to minimize disclosure of information. Privacy by design, privacy by default, wherever possible, except of course, when it goes about fraud or about you know, enabling the government to make sure business is legal when they earn money. Okay, now we want people to use it, so it needs to be usable, right? Uh, and we don't want to burn down the planet running it, so it needs to be efficient. Um, we want to avoid single points of failure. Now, of course, if a bank runs it, you know, a central bank runs it and they print too much money, you know, <laughs> that could be a problem. Um, and it's a protocol, so different parts of the system can be run by different entities. You could have actually businesses competing, right? We, we provide one implementation of wallet, you could provide a different one. Right? So different components can be enhanced, improved by different parties, operated by different parties. It's not like there's this one instance of the system. Right? So these were our design principles. If you agree with these design principles and think this is desirable, then the system is for you. If you want to argue about these design principles meet with me, I'm happy to argue against it. <laughs> but usually most people go and say, yeah, this seems to make sense. Right? Okay, let me give you a very high level overview. So these are like the main components. We have what we call the exchange, it's like the central service that would be run by the bank. It allows you to withdraw digital coins. Now notice at this point when you withdraw the coins, you are identified. We know who you are, you're getting them maybe from your bank account and so on. Remember, you're receiving money here, right? Now when you as a customer spend the coins, that's where the customer has the privacy only when they spend the money. And when the merchant has to then basically, he can't spend the money again, he has to deposit the coins, basically make sure they're real and valid and so on, uh, to claim their value, um, and then again, the merchant is identified. And we have, as a fourth part, an auditor. It's basically somebody who can check on the bank, are you operating correctly? Are you following the protocol? You know, do you have enough money in your bank account? You know, so is your balance sheet proper? We don't just want to trust the exchange model, yeah, everything is fine, let's not look at that. Right. So, now we look at the money flow, a bit more detailed version of the same picture. Usually as a customer, you will start by saying, okay, I have here my wallet, and I have my computer, I'm going to go talk to my 
bank, you know, some retail bank that I'm banking with, and then tell them, I would like to withdraw some digital money, so please do a wire transfer from my bank account to the central bank or the operator of the payment system. Right? So here, whatever, send 10,000 uh, Taiwanese dollars, right? And then basically, once the money has arrived, we will allow the customer to withdraw that amount of money into their wallet. And we know who they are, because of course, you know, we saw the customer's bank. So there's some KYC already here. Now, the customer can spend the money at the merchant, the merchant has to deposit the coins, and then the central bank will send the money back to the merchant's bank account. Now you might go, okay, how is this possibly more efficient if we have basically in the end two wire transfers here, where today we'd have only one wire transfer here. But you're thinking it's maybe slightly wrong here. What you should, th should think of is, this is like going to the ATM, you know. You don't get five cents at the ATM. I don't know what you typically get here, but maybe 10,000 Taiwanese dollars or something like that, right? So you do a big withdrawal here. Now here, you do your tiny transactions. One bus ticket, one meal, whatever. And the, the logic here aggregates transfers. Not for every time the merchant deposits coins, we do a wire transfer. The merchant can say, pay me at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month. We sum up everything and then do one big transfer. You know, maybe a couple of million Taiwanese dollars to the merchant. So here we do macro transactions, large transactions, in the traditional banking system. And here we can do micro transactions. Huh? Now, one key thing to see here is when you spend the coins, you do so anonymously. Which also means that you don't have to authenticate to spend money. In fact, you can't, right? Who would you authenticate against if you're supposed to have privacy? Now, usually, we've all been learning, you know, if you want to have more security and so on, more privacy, you know, using the Tor browser, it gets expensive and complicated and slow. But here, we can skip the authentication. We will not need it. And actually, this becomes more usable, which is also critical for microtransactions because the problem isn't transaction cost. The problem is mental transaction cost, you know, approving the transaction, you know. That's why it's very convenient with the credit cards and this whole bing, 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 right? That's how microtransactions can work. And we want that on the internet. Okay, so I have, uh, I, I'm feeling daring today, so I'm gonna try to do the demo <laughs> from a distance. And we just two days ago updated the entire demo, so who knows what's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so here I already, I have of course a Firefox here, right? <laughs> um, and I already, maybe you can change the resolution yeah. so we can see a bit more. Okay, so I already loaded the Tata web extension oh. uh, into my Firefox. I'm sure you all know how to install a web extension here, right? Next to all the ad blockers and so on. Um, and so first thing we're going to do is we're going to create uh, our own little test bank account. Okay, password, I'll pick the long one. So, um, and now I should explain, this bank here um, is a test, it's not a real bank, right? And so, the currency for our test bank is called kudos. But please mentally substitute euros, dollars, or whatever, right? <laughs> it's not like you're actually going to pay in kudos. We actually had the German Central Bank contact us and say, you're running this payment system as kudos. <laughs> you may need the regulatory thing. was going, no, this is <laughs> the most funny money out there. <laughs> you know? So, and what we do, because we need to create money for the test, is when you sign up for an account, you get 100 kudos for free. Isn't that generous of us? There's no real use for them, but uh, you know, we need to have some source. So this is why, we, why you have this bonus transaction there at the beginning. Okay. So, now I've, I've logged into my bank account and this is supposed to simulate like a normal bank online banking experience, right? Um, and here we can basically say, okay, we have a Tala integration that allows us to send money to our Tala wallet. So I can basically specify, I want to whatever, withdraw 25 kudos to my Tala wallet. You know, click on continue. Now I've got two choices. I can either scan the QR code if I have the Tala app on my Apple or iPhone, 
or I can withdraw to my web extension here, in which case the web extension starts. You see it in the top mask extensions. So now I'm in the web extension context, different security context, and the network takes a while. Okay. And now basically says, okay, this exchange is offering you 25 kudos. Do you want to do this? Um, and I can confirm, yeah, please do withdraw the 25 kudos. Now it goes back to the bank and uh, place, you know, pin, ton, check. We've seen that there's a captcha here. Just think the idea you got an SMS on your mobile phone or something like that to authenticate yourself as a second factor. Um, and I authorize the wire transfer. And now what you can see here, what has happened is that there was a wire transfer of the 25 kudos to some bank account in the system which belongs to the payment service operator. And the wire transfer subject here should look a bit odd to you. Any idea what that is? It's the one place where a normal user gets to see cryptography in our system. That's a public key that identifies your wallet. Oh. Basically, the interaction with the web extension was to figure out who is this browser? Who should be able to get the coins? Mm. And we use this public key to identify the respective web extension that can now do the withdrawal. In the background, the withdrawal will have already happened here. So you can see, that, okay, I had some money or some kudos before, and then I've got more kudos in there. Uh, so my money is already arrived. Okay. This is actually the complicated part of the day. So now let's go shopping. And here we have, a, I always say, a starving author who, who wrote some book and wants to sell his uh, uh, articles. Right? So you can think of this as like a journalist who wants to sell some uh, articles. And I can go, okay, here, this is like the teasers. I can say, okay, this is the one I want to read. And, uh, well, it's a paywall. Right? Now, again, I can scan the QR code, or I can, in this case, go into the web extension. And here again it says, okay, the price for this article is 0.5 kudos. We have some transaction fees possibly, again, configurable of course. Um, and I can confirm the payment. And then I have paid the jumps to the article. Mm -hmm. huh? So that's the payment experience. Um, let me see if I can pick another article just to be... So here... Uh, this one, find the free software criteria. Okay, let me see, I have to put this down. So, if I can unlock my phone. So, okay. Oh, I did not, okay, I need to get some money into my wallet before I do this. Um, let's go back to the bank. Let's withdraw some more money first. Can't pay with an empty phone. So again, now here I basically have a way in the app to scan a QR code. Mm -hmm. Right, so it just scans the QR code and says, "Okay, it's not working." So here, it does this, you're about to withdraw 25 kudos? Shall we do this? You know, I have some terms of service I have to accept here. Click on confirm withdraw. I know it's a bit hard to see, but you can imagine. Now it goes to, okay, authorize the transaction to that mobile phone, transfer the money, so withdrawal confirmed, and uh, now I have 25 kudos in my mobile phone. Right? Could have also done it by a peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Anyway, um, get there later. So now here, I can just again click on scan QR code, scan the QR code, uh, it shows me what I'm about to buy. Mm -hmm. Now look at this, I click here. Mm -hmm. Oops. Clicking is hard. Mm -hmm. right. um, and uh, there comes the article. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. So the kudos now showing up in the, uh, like the authors or status wallet now? So the, yes, the, so the, the retailer, well, he doesn't have a wallet, he has oh. a bank account. Oh, bank account. And it will be transferred to the bank account oh. of the retailer at the frequency the retailer has configured. Oh. Remember, the idea is this website could sell, sell, sell for five cents mm -hmm. and do a hundred thousand of these a day. Mm -hmm. And you might want to just, at the end of the day, do one settlement in the core banking system. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
Uh, we also have peer-to-peer -peer transfers, so basically I can go into my wallet here and uh, say I want to whatever send kudos, you know, to another wallet, mm -hmm. right? And then it will also generate me a QR code. Whatever test, I'll make offer for one week, one day, and here I can show the QR code, and now somebody could scan this QR code with their Tyler wallet and would get one kudos from my browser wallet into whatever wallet they have. Mm -hmm. right, so there's lots of ways to do the transfers as you would imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay, enough demo? Okay, so since, this, since I was told this was the crypto meeting, <laughs> <laughs> are you ready for some cryptography? <laughs> okay, so first of all, I should stress this is all ancient stuff. Wow. You know, cryptographic hash functions we've known since 89, blind signatures since 93, and so on. And Michael will say, why is he using all this old stuff? <laughs> well, the answer is because we really, really understand this well. You know, this not, nobody's going to break those things. Now, of course, we don't use, you know, uh, as a hash function, whatever, MD4. You know, we use sharp with 512. Uh, but the idea of what a hash function is, we all understand pretty well. Right, so I, I, it's good to not have experimental cryptography run your payment system. Right. So that's the point of this slide. Okay, now on the taxability again, okay, what is the goal here is to say the merchant's income I can see because I see the deposits. The merchant enters into a contract with the customer. The hash of the contract is embedded with the deposit data. And so therefore the state can go and say, okay, you got this amount of money. Tell me what the contract was, and let's see then what you owe in terms of taxes, right? Now, there are two limitations to this. One is what we call the withdrawal loophole. When you withdraw money, like I just started from my bank account, how do I know if this mobile phone was my mobile phone? It could have been your mobile phone, right? That no payment system can prevent. If you take your credit card, put it to an ATM, and your spouse takes out the money, right? <laughs> you know. No chance, right? If you give your spouse your credit card number and they pay with your credit card, no chance, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the other case is again, sharing coins amongst friend, family and friends. What we're talking about here is taxability for transactions where you don't fully trust the other party. If I give you my mobile phone, of course you can pay with it, mm -hmm. right? So those are not things where we can do anything about, right? And so this is not what we claim. We claim if the two parties don't trust each other, the merchant wants to get paid, right? And they don't just go, oh yeah, we'll trust the guy, he will pay us, probably. He's an honest customer, right? Well, they want to be sure that they will pay. That's a transaction. Okay. Now, for the cryptographers or mathematicians amongst you, on the left, you find the formulas. On the right, you find the pretty pictures, right? So, uh, I'll mostly focus on the pretty pictures, <laughs> but the formulas are there for those who want them. Now, we start at the exchange or the payment service provider by throwing together some random numbers. Let's call them P and Q, you know, two primes and so on. Um, and from those numbers, we will generate two things. On the left, the seal is what you consider a public key, which is kind of showing, you know, this is real money. You know, it's digitally signed. And we have a hammer, which is representing the private key, which allows us to put that seal on things. Right? You've heard a bit about public private key crypto before, yeah, I yeah, see, yeah. right? So this is easy. Okay. Now, the merchant, I had to use some slightly different measure here, um, is also going to you know, roll some dice and create itself a private key, small m. And with the small m, they can sign something as the merchant. You know, just say, yeah, I approve this contract, I approve this operation. Easy piece. And last but not least, the customer also needs some keys. Actually, I'm only showing a tiny subset of all the keys in the system. Again, we create ourselves some private key small c, and we derive well, what you could think of as like a serial number on the coin, mm -hmm. something that makes the coin unique. Mm -hmm. But also, we will have then the ability to make a signature with that. Basically saying, I, the owner of this coin, approve spending it for a particular purpose. Now notice, this is get a coin. Technically, you should think of this as like a planchet in English, but planchet is not a term most people know. 
It's like the, the thing that, it's like a total coin. It's just the metal. It hasn't been signed yet. It doesn't have the perfect shape yet, right? Like the raw metal. It's put in shape, but it doesn't have the proper numbers of printing or signatures on it, right? That's a planchet. Okay, now, when we want to do the withdrawal, the first thing we do is we make more random numbers. It's the after all. Um, and with this number B, we're going to blind the coin planchet and put it in an envelope. So the B signs, seals the envelope, so we can't look inside anymore. Mm -hmm. But inside that envelope is the coin. And when we want to withdraw money, that's what we actually send to the exchange. Now, what the exchange will then do is it will take its hammer and hammer on the envelope. Notice it can't open it. It doesn't know what's in there. Right? But it knows I'm using, say, the one Taiwanese dollar hammer. Right? So it's going to put a signature on there that says this is a one Taiwanese dollar coin. And we're going to send that back to the customer. And then the customer can open the envelope with their small b and basically gets out what we call a real, so it's the final real coin. It has the serial number on it that the customer picked and has the signature from the bank saying this is real money now. And what is critical is that the bank never learned the serial number when it issued the coin. But it is unique. So we can make sure it's only spent once. Because one of the big problems, of course, with electronic money is double spending. You know, how do I prevent people from making a copy? Well, in our case, we don't. You can make copies. It's free software. Right? Do a backup. But you can only spend it once. First time you spend the money, it's gone. No longer valid. OK. So now, when we want to go shopping, we first build ourselves some shopping cart. You know, what do we want to buy? Have to agree to that somehow. Um, and then we take that contract. Um, and the merchant is going to sign it. You know, it's like my commercial offer to your customer. If you pay me money for this, I will do whatever the contract specifies. And then what the customer will do is it will take their coin, which consists of the small c, and the proof that this is a real coin, sign the contract with the money. So basically, you don't sign as the customer. Your money signs the contract to accept. Well, so Spending the money and accepting the contract, that's the same thing. So you sign the contract with your money, and you attach the proof that this was real money. And you send that to the merchant. The merchant then basically checks the signature. You know, is this money that was issued by the bank? Right? And then has to check with the bank to say, well, was this money spent before? Mm -hmm. If it was spent before, we have a signature of the same coin on a different contract. And we can reject it and say the customer is trying to cheat. But if the, we've never seen this coin, but the signature is valid, then we know, OK, so first time, this has to go to this merchant. This has to be happening in real time for you yes. spending, for yes. you buying things. Yes. Okay. It's happening in real time online at that time. Yes. Right? It's an online payment system. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you have to answer. <laughs> Okay. Is this part clear? Okay. Shall we dive a bit deeper? Okay. So now this is the funny part is this year we basically knew since the 1990s how to do. It. This is how old the idea is. 1990. But there was one problem in 1990s, namely. Okay, now I want to pay 100 euros, but here maybe I have only a one cent coin. I have to do 10,000 signatures and validate 10,000 signatures. That would be a nightmare, right? Now, we can, of course, offer multiple denominations. I can say I've got the one Taiwanese dollar, two Taiwanese dollar, four Taiwanese dollar, eight Taiwanese dollar. Fine. But then what if I don't have exact change, right? I have an eight Taiwanese dollar coin, but I want to spend seven. Mm -hmm. Now what? I can't tell a normal user, yeah, you've got enough money, but not change, and so therefore you can't spend it, <laughs> right? Then they would start withdrawing every, always one cent coins. So every time right. you, you want to spend, you asking the money from the bank. 
So they no, can, that okay. you can't do either. You can't withdraw at the time when you want to spend, uh -huh. because to withdraw from the, from the bank, yeah. you need to identify yourself. Uh -huh. And you want to make those transactions unlinkable. Oh, you don't okay. want to send a signal, oh, somebody is spending 3 euro 27, yeah. and oh, look, just two seconds earlier, that person withdrew 3 euro 27. Oh, okay. You don't get good privacy if you do that. Oh, yeah. Right. Not to mention, then you have to authenticate towards your bank yeah. to make a transaction. You want to make that fast and quick. Okay. So you want to withdraw larger amounts ahead of time, uh -huh. and you don't exactly know what you're going to spend in the future. At least I don't. You know, maybe you have a perfect budgeting and you know with the week in advance, you know, I'm going to need these amounts, but most people don't, right? So, okay, so wallet may not have exact change. And of course, uh, if I have enough money, I should be able to pay. So how can we make that? Well, in addition, we have a couple of further goals. We also want to make sure that we maintain our liquidity. So when you spend money and then maybe you get some kind of change, I shouldn't be able to say, oh, this is the same person who's spending the change and who made this original transaction. Right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe you ordered something to your home one day and then you donate it to the opposition party the next day. Mm -hmm. And if that was your change, these two transactions being linkable, that could break your privacy. Mm -hmm. right? Change should be indistinguishable from other money. Shouldn't have some kind of drawback. Mm -hmm. right? Economists would call this fungibility. Money is money, not you know different kinds of money. And the second goal, of course, is we need to maintain taxability of transactions. I shouldn't be able to use the change mechanism to cheat the tax man, to break our security goal of income transparency. So it must not interfere with the privacy or the income transparency if we do this. Okay, very high level approach. First of all, when we spend a coin, as part of a contract signature, we can say, well, this is a whatever eight Taiwanese dollar coin, but I only want to spend seven out of the eight. Mm -hmm. That's easy, right? Just put into the signature, don't spend the full amount, only spend some of it. And then what we can do is we can go to the payment service board and say, look, I spent seven out of eight, give me one and change. Mm -hmm. oh. That's okay. Doesn't it yet achieve all of our goals? But that's the high level idea, right? I can spend, if I have enough money, I can spend the large denomination, like the 10,000 Taiwanese dollar bill, and I will get change back. So far, so good. But how do we do the change? Well, I will first need another pretty picture here. Uh, for those of you who studied crypto, this is the diffie hellman picture. Uh, but you can think of it as a lock with two keys. And the two keys are going to call C and T. And if you have either of those two keys, you can open the lock. Okay? Now, here's a straw man solution for the problem. One that straw man means doesn't work, right? But it might give us some inspiration. And so the idea is basically this. Um, moving the screen by accident here. Okay. So. Uh, you make yourself a new coin that you want to get in terms of exchange. You blind it like before, put it into an envelope, and send it to the exchange and says, look, you know, I have this whatever eight Taiwanese dollar coin, seven were spent. Here give me one Taiwanese dollar in change, you know, and you sign this with the old coin that had the one Taiwanese dollar in change left on it. Right? That would be the simplest way, just ask for change. Mm. Yeah. Give the proof of the previous transaction where there was some residual money, ask for change. Now what's the problem with this? The big problem is basically, how do you know that the owner of the old coin, the person who spent the eight Taiwanese dollar, is the same person who has the new coin, the one Taiwanese dollar? Let me put it differently. How would you launder money if this was the case? Well, simple scenario. You take your 10 billion Taiwanese dollars and you spend one of them. And then you take change for the remaining 9 billion, 999 million Taiwanese dollars, except you have the recipient create the new coin keys, right? Put them into the envelope and you sign and say, yeah, please give me change. Mm -hmm. And of course the signature and all the coins will be owned by the other person. Right, so this would allow 
the transfer of ownership to somebody else. If the scene you is known to somebody different from the from the person who has the C old. The problem clear? You need to make sure the owner of the change is the same owner as the owner of the original coin. Otherwise money can be transferred here to a different entity. Okay. Well, here's the revised setup. What we're going to do is we're going to take the old coin and a random number T, compute the diffie hellman of both of those, derive from that using hash functions, the C new and the B new, and put that into an envelope and send that to the exchange. At this point, you should go and say, okay, it's now clearly insane because from the point of view of the exchange, this is exactly the same as the previous one that I explained to you was broken. You know, the exchange gets this envelope. Well, whether I constructed it this way, whatever that's supposed to do, or this way, you know, how would the exchange know that I even followed the new rule? Well, so that clearly doesn't quite work yet. And if something doesn't quite work, the cryptographic solution to making it work is to do it three times. Mm -hmm. yeah? <laughs> okay, so we're going to not ask for change once, but three times. That's going to fix it. Are you confused yet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but after we do this three times, what the exchange is going to do is going to play a game one, two, or three. It's going to pick a random number mm -hmm. and say, okay, gamma equals two. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't predict that, what I was going to choose. Right? Um, and then the customer, if gamma was two, has to send T1 and T3 to the exchange. Has to basically disclose these two random numbers. And then what we can do as the exchange, we can go and put T1, open the lock, and check that that gives us this envelope. Basically, we validate two out of the three constructions. And then we can build, have some statistical assurance that the third one was correct. Now, if you're deep into crypto, you might go and say, yeah, but then you would need to do this 100 million times to have a good security level. Actually, no, three is perfectly enough in most cases. Because what we're going to do is, if you didn't follow the rules, we'll just keep the money. So if you cheat, basically your tax rate is two thirds. Now, most countries don't have an income tax exceeding two thirds on basically anything. Now, if your income tax is 90%, Okay, then we have to do it 10 times, right? Remember, the attacker is trying to hide his income. You know, we don't need to achieve the cryptographic security levels we usually have, we just need to make sure that he, if he cheats, he has an economic loss that is worse than if he had paid his taxes. That's enough. Right, so actually three in most countries is going to be enough. Okay, so. Still doesn't quite explain everything, but we now can at least trust that the customer did this construction. And if he did, we're going to blind sign this thing and return it to him. And the customer can get the new money just like they could get the original money when they withdraw. But how does this prevent the transfer of money to somebody else? Well, we need one more thing. What we need is a little protocol, which we call the linking protocol, where the exchange, when, you, when I give it the old coin, it will return to me the T gamma, the public key, and the envelope of the coin. Just gives me those two things back. Like a little oracle. It has learned these two things in the process, it gives those back to me. And now what happens is that with this protocol, the owner of the old coin can also open the diffie helmet and also get the new coin. Which means, if you were to try to use this protocol to transfer money to somebody else, you could do this, but the owner of the old coin could get to the change at any time. Basically, this allows the owner of the old coin to get his hands on the new money. Which means you didn't actually transfer it to a different entity, the old one still has control over it. Now, maybe the other guy also has the new coin, but that's now both have control. I can always make a copy. 
right? So that's the big trick here. Now with this, we can do a couple of things. We can give unlinkable change, so we solve the problem of giving change. We can actually also give refunds to people, basically putting the money back on a coin and then running this protocol. We can handle expiration of keys, basically saying if I have money that's about to expire, because some crypto keys expire, we can basically use this protocol to issue new keys. And if there's network failures or any kind of component failure, we can also use this to recover the money. So this has lots of applications, this one little protocol. Okay. How are you doing on the crypto? <laughs> Okay, I'll give you a brief, quick introduction for some of the other topics we've done. So with age restrictions, we basically can add to money the ability to say, okay, this money comes with an age restriction. You can give this to your child, say, this is for purchases below age 16, and now they can't buy things that are 18 only. They have all the privacy properties of Tala, they can still buy it anonymously, and the only thing the merchant learns is they say, you need to prove to me you're above 14, and they will learn, the person is above 14. They don't learn if it was a minor or an adult, mm -hmm. but they just know the money came with old enough. Mm -hmm. well, the high level approach basically is that you, uh, well, you assume that the money in the bank accounts belongs to adults, mm -hmm. but when you are an adult and you give your child money, you commit to a maximum age for that money that you give to your kid. Um, the miner can prove that they have adequate age to a merchant. The merchant has to, of course, be legally required to check. <laughs> Most jurisdictions are the case. And when there is change being given to the, to the miner, we actually can make sure that the age restriction remains in place. So it's not like, you know, it was on the original money and then on the change it's lost. No, it will stay in place on all of the change as well. Okay, I'll skip over the details. Here comes the math. We really want the math. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. All that all the math is doing the edge one. It's only the edge restriction. Yeah, yeah. Wow. This, this is actually yeah. Um, and since I was told this was the cryptocurrency meetup, we also have uh, the product depolymerization, mm -hmm. where we can basically uh, run a Tala exchange over a blockchain. Oh. So you can. Uh, pay with Bitcoin or Ethereum mm -hmm. using Tala. Mm -hmm. The only problem is doing so legally. Oh. Because which bank is willing to touch this stuff properly and how do you, you know, all of the legal. Technically it's no problem. So you can have the same convenience and speed of transactions um, that you would have uh, basically instead of using the core banking system you usually have, you would use a blockchain mm -hmm. and then you have off-chain transactions in with the Tala system. And so that's depolymerization. Again, I'll skip over the technical details. The, 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 the requirement of the of the of the real bank is the is is by design in the in the in the protocol, or it's it's all it's it's okay to like replace the bank with like some kind of like smart contract or something else. Um, the problem is that uh, if you replace it with a smart contract, yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody needs to validate it. And to validate that the smart contract is satisfied, you then have a very expensive computation. Oh, right? So here, if you, if you have a trusted entity yeah. that is a banking institution that has one auditor, yeah. you can go and say it's done. The auditor checks, the bank is, 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 is approved by the state, and we all believe this is working. Mm -hmm. right? The moment you go and say, no, 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 we need a smart contract to validate it, now you have to take all of the data, replicate it to all of the validators, mm -hmm. um, and they all have to check all of the signatures, and now you're talking about insanity. Mm -hmm. right. So the scalability and performance you don't get when you decentralize it. Basically, the block blockchain trilemma still holds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is a blockchain behind this project? No. Oh. No. What, I'm, what we're saying is, with the depolymerization, you could put a blockchain mm -hmm. behind it as the core banking system. Yeah. But usually, we would put, you know, ACH for America, SEPA for Europeans, and God knows what is used here. I have no idea what it's called, yeah. the core banking system. Um, you know, but we just use the normal wire transfers between bank accounts as the banking system. Mm -hmm. So no, no need for a blockchain at all. Yeah. Okay, now. 
let me give you a little bit of what's happening. So first of all, uh, we have a mailing list, of course. We have a bug tracker. We have a Git repository. But most new news is, have you heard about, about an LNet here in Titan? What? An LNet. An LNet is a Dutch foundation. It's the largest organization supporting free software oh. development globally. No, no. An LNet. And an LNet. they will also support people in Taiwan. Oh. So if you are a free software developer, you can apply for funding there. And we have a new project funded by the European Commission to put Tala into operation in Europe. Yeah, yeah. But as part of this, an LNet will globally award grants to developers to do integration of Tala into whatever cool no. things you yeah. can think of. Yeah, it's not very good. I haven't mm -hmm. ever heard about it. Okay, so it's a Dutch foundation. Yeah. The application process is pretty simple. You can write an application in a matter of hours if you have a good idea. Just have to describe, this is what I want to do, this is my budget, you know, talk a bit about what are the surrounding projects, you know, talk a bit about yourself, uh, why you're good to do that job, mm -hmm. and you can apply and receive funding. Um, I know of, well, there's, you, you can find on the website like a thousand free software projects that have been funded mm -hmm. uh, under this work. And so if you are interested in working with Tala, integrating Tala into anything interesting, um, into some e-commerce shops, into some other applications you have. This is a place where you can get funding to do this kind of work. From the European government for a change. <laughs> and as I said, the process is very easy. We have also, as, I, as you've mentioned, that you're doing translation work here. There is the weblate.tala.net. Yeah. Um, we have the website of Tala already, at least partially, in. I have no idea if the translation is of, is of any good quality into uh, yeah, these yeah. languages, but uh, maybe it's good. Yeah, it's, you know, it's fine. I can't say. <laughs> can't read anything. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, uh, we can uh, understand it. But the the website is also used for translating all of the user interfaces, you know, all of the wallets and so on. I am sure there's uh, lots of strings that look uh, need translation. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to volunteer for translation, there is an email address you can look at and uh, get an account and help us translate and make this thing available. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to integrate Tala into any kind of e-commerce solution, there is a REST API that is specified at docs.tala.net. Basically, you can do this with, well, maybe three simple requests. The first one would be you post the contract terms, like how much are you supposed to pay me for what to the merchant backend. Um, then you can tell the user, go to this URL, open this QR code, whatever, with your wallet and do the payment. And then you do a GET request on the backend saying, have I been paid yet? And when it comes back saying yes, then you've been paid. So it's a very simple API for the merchant. So, but lots of integration documentation there. Uh, there's the Brunet Association behind it, and of course we are also always looking for partners as the business. So if you're interested in working with us on the business side, you know, carlosystems.com is employing many of the developers behind the project. Yeah, and if you want more cryptography, <laughs> here are some of the technical papers behind this. Okay. So, so the, the earliest one is like from 1990. Yeah, this is the original si original system. is just the blind signature approach. Oh, oh, oh. right. But then when, when you talk about giving change, uh, that is basically the 2016 oh. series of work. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the use for central digital currency come a bit later. Yeah. Right. And then the age restrictions are the top one. Mm -hmm. But this is the most important one, including you can get money. <laughs> uh, ah, what is important is internet funding always works on deliverables. So you have to do the work you propose to do and then you get paid. Oh. Right, they don't just send you money and then hope you do something. Mm -hmm. But you can define milestones right, that are reasonably fine grained and you can get paid by milestone. Okay. 
Now I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I have some questions. Uh, since we have NGBOC in Taiwan, it's like a credit card settlement institution. And if uh, we have a new uh, tower in Taiwan, how will it uh, be, become some backlash or some, something will be faster in Taiwan? Well, usually, of course, these kind of free systems um, cannibalize existing proprietary technology. Right? So if you put a new Linux system into the market, Microsoft hurts. Mm. Right? Um, similarly, if this were to be deployed, and MasterCard, Visa card currently take whatever, 2-3% of every transaction, mm -hmm. well, they will lose money there. Mm. Right? Um, the other thing is, of course, we have a surveillance apparatus that feeds on payment data surveillance. So you might have seen in the Snowden slides, for example, that they have been hacking SWIFT and other international payment services. Uh, this will make that, well, less useful. Right? Yeah, I, think, um, I think that's it. And problem. from a political perspective, yeah. uh, you might similarly think, do I want to be dependent on the big credit card companies? Yeah. Do I want to be dependent on the Chinese CBDC mm -hmm. that is being integrated with other countries across Asia for trade? Or do we want to have an alternative that we control? And this is free software. So yes, I wrote some of it, mm -hmm. but it's free software. I can't tell you, you have to stop using it. The we you have the source code, you have the rights. Yeah. The we inside, right? the we of the whole system, including the, like the, 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 the bank who implement the whole stuff, uh, that it means that uh, the we is including the bank or including the, the central, Facility who like deposit the money and verify the Okay, it can be implemented by one bank yeah. or by multiple banks yeah. or by just normal payment service providers that have to have the right e money licenses. Uh -huh. Right? And we as you know humans, yeah. you know, we are in control of our software here, of our computing. Uh -huh. And I can have the source code for my wallet. Yeah. Right? How many of your credit card applications do you have the source code to? Uh -huh. Right? And when you do the integrations there as a developer, you're using some proprietary APIs. Mm. Right? Here it's all free software. Yeah. So this respects your sovereignty, both on a national level, as well as on a personal level, mm. as well as on a business level. Right? That's the advantage. You stay in control of your data, you stay in control of your computing, right? you're not making yourself dependent, and you might actually be able to establish an alternative to these existing Systems that, in my view, as a new maintainer, are simply unjust. So, can we operate our own Taylor system? Uh, yes, so we have had people at German hacker conferences, mm -hmm. just for fun, operate a Tala instance for paying pure pizza at a camp, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or paying for drinks at a conference. Yeah. Um, I am operating one at my university where people where we have built a snack machine <laughs> with Tala, where you can pay for snacks with Tala, <coughs> um, but in Swiss francs in that case. So yes, you can operate your own. However, the moment you grow a little bit beyond the size of this room, Mm -hmm. You might want to be aware of the authorities that might at some point come to you and say, do you have a banking license? And if you say no, <laughs> yes. they might go and say, there is a little bit of a place because you use bars. <laughs> right? So if you have a small community like this, usually the authorities don't care. Yeah. Or there might even be exceptions for this uh, as an internal accounting system. But the moment you start to sign up merchants and run this for real as a bank, you better have a payment license. Right? So that, that's, and you better abide by you know, KYC and AML rules mm -hmm. and so on. You know, we have the ability to integrate KYC services over OAuth 2, for example. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not like we don't support that already, but you then need to possibly abide by applicable regulation. Mm -hmm. And that usually means it's no longer a hobby project. What's the benefit of the whole uh, protocol compared to the cryptocurrency? Compared to the cryptocurrencies, well, first of all, it can't be used for crime. Uh, oh. If you look at oh. Monero, it's one of the worst things for yeah. crime online ever. Yeah. Secondly, 
it doesn't use crazy amounts of energy. You know, Bitcoin using the electricity of Japan, of entire countries, yeah. you know, probably Taiwan yeah. is in that category. You know, it's doing what, five transactions per second? Yeah, yeah. We have done on a single computer <laughs> 60,000 transactions per second. Uh, that single computer didn't use as much power as Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Right? So <laughs> Uh, it wasn't this notebook style, but it's still, yeah. the point is it's way more efficient mm -hmm. and it's, and the last thing is on the blockchains, on some of them you have no privacy guarantees. Yeah. It might still be traceable, it's all on a public blockchain as they say, yeah. right? So unless you have the Monero style, where then you have excessive privacy in my view, mm -hmm. and excessive crime, mm -hmm. you may have no privacy. So here we can say when you spend money, you have strict privacy. And at the same time, you are not opening yourself up to crime. So we're not burning down the planet, we're not opening ourselves up for crime, we are protecting your privacy, and we are scaling. Those are the key differences to blockchains and cryptocurrencies. So can the mobile app, mobile app or the web extension just select which tower system they are integrated with? Um, They're connected to? So the uh, wallet, Mobile apps are always multi-currency capable, so you can withdraw in the same wallet, euros and dollars and Swiss francs, and possibly from different banks as well, mm -hmm. right? So, and as a merchant who is receiving transactions, you of course can say, I'm willing, I, I want to be paid in dollars, right? And maybe you also specify and only accept these payments from the providers, right? Don't give me, you know, most Taiwan US dollars, right? I don't believe that these guys are real, right? So you can, choose and say, okay, these are the trusted providers for payment services. I'm willing to accept payments from those. And uh, the wallet will then pay with the respective cards that the merchant selected, so to speak. Let's say the Taiwan Central government, uh, the Taiwan Central Bank suddenly offer, operate their own Taiwan system and the US government of, operate their own system. Yeah. So when I need to, when I pay in Taiwan, I need to switch to the ta this Taiwan network. So is it possible to do on the app? Okay, so assuming that you had the, the, the here the central bank, the CBC oper operate a Tyler central bank digital currency, and the US government did the same thing for US dollars. Yeah. Well, first of all, your wallet can hold both currencies, yeah. and of course there could be a commercial service that allows you to convert yeah. one currency in the other. So you can spend Taiwanese dollars there and buy US dollars from that service. Mm -hmm. Again, such a conversion service might have to abide by certain regulations for, to identify who is doing the conversion, especially international money transfers are usually a bit iffy in that regards, right? But in principle, you can just do the conversion. Now, the Tala wallet itself is never doing conversion. Mm -hmm. right? A merchant can say, I allow you to pay me in US dollars or Taiwanese dollars or euros, right? Uh, or a merchant could allow you to do explicit conversion or a bank could do that, mm -hmm. but the money in your wallet is always in one currency. It's not like this automatic thing that you have as credit cards. But of course you could theoretically hack up a merchant and update the wallet to have some kind of automatic conversion. Right? But so far my, my concern has been mostly getting it into a couple of countries in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> and then we can worry about conversion. Do you want to ask a question? You can ask a Okay. So can I think of it as a safer cryptocurrency? Like, uh, because cryptocurrencies have many scams. Like, uh, they don't protect their privacy on the client. Right? So. Well, you, it's safer in the sense of it would be regulated and you wouldn't have the fluctuations that you have as cryptocurrencies, well, unless I guess here if you are in a country that has excessive inflation maybe, right? But you would have the same kind of uh, uh, assurance about monetary policy that you get as a central bank. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have some algorithm decide how much should be in circulation. You don't have some, you know, you, you have some central bank that can decide how much they put into circulation, what interest rates to charge and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and you would presumably pay your taxes in the same currency, all of which do not quite apply for cryptocurrencies. Um, the 
similarity, the closest similarity of is it's still self-custody. So when you have a Bitcoin wallet, a proper one, not FTX, right? Then your Bitcoins <laughs> are on your computer, and if you lose your computer, you lose your money. Yeah. And the same is true here. If oh. I click on reset on this wallet, then my kudos are gone. Oh. There's no more trace of them anywhere. Now I can do a backup. If I forgot to do a backup, or it's five years old, mm -hmm. then my money is lost. Now, this money I put onto my wallet is supposed to be for spending, oh. right? You don't have your life savings in physical cash mm -hmm. wallet, right? You keep them in your bank account. With Bitcoin, you don't have that choice. You must have it, well, either at FTX or on your phone. On your phone. Here, you can say, okay, I'm gonna transfer a certain amount of my wealth for my daily life expenses into my electronic wallet, right? Those I take into self-custody, and the rest remains with the bank, right? But for what you have in self-custody, you are responsible, right? And that's a little bit where they have a similarity with Bitcoin. From the bank or from the perspective of the of the bank, who either implement Tower or implement a, a, a blockchain, it's, it looks like very similar to them. The, the, the features or the yeah besides the, the, the energy things. Well, I never quite understood why any bank would implement a blockchain. Yeah. Oh, city building. Mm -hmm. city but they mostly what they want is an append only database. Yeah, yeah. And the Tata database is in some sense append only. Yeah. Right? Most of the transactions simply insert new transaction data and store it. Mm -hmm. Right? So in that sense, we get that security property as well. Uh, and but banks have done append only databases forever. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's not a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. And the very few banks go for an open, decentralized blockchain that is truly permissionless, right? So th that's very few projects that go in that direction. Yeah, yeah, most of them um, run, run the blockchain by themselves. And, you know, using a blockchain as a database replication mechanism, well, we have ways to replicate databases, you know. Yeah. We have a pen on the databases, so what's the new thing here, <laughs> right? Um, here you actually have more interesting cryptography that secures the transaction. I can prove that I made a purchase. I can prove that I should receive money. I have provable privacy properties, mm -hmm. right? All of these things do not hold if you just say I'm using a blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, as Tesla can can be traced who who paid this money. So when talking about checking out who is doing a money money laundering, so how can Tesla be from people doing money laundering? Money laundering when you can trace who is paying. Is that you usually, first of all, you see who's receiving the money. So if you are running some business to launder money, you typically try to, you know, hide that you're receiving money mm -hmm. uh, uh, from additional sources. So here it's clear, you know, whatever that pizzeria is making billions of dollars, and it's a bit suspicious because they're not selling that much in pizza, right? The second thing is, when you get money in the first place in the system, we still know who you are. You're supposed to get it from your checking account. Right? So the usual assumption is that the money kind of comes in clean. It comes in from a clean source, your normal checking account, right? And you can't hide where you send it. Right? I can't use this for extortion. I can't just you know duck your child and say send me a billion Taiwanese dollars because you would know who I am if I get this billion Taiwanese dollars. Mm. Because currently there is a scam that they just entire they just just steal entire bank account. They steal the entire bank account. And they throw it in the teller and not right. okay. So if, if I take control of your bank account, yeah. right? Uh, first of all, that's a problem with your bank account, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we somewhat reduce this because uh, yes. right now you kind of constantly have to access your bank account for every transaction, right? Here you would rarely do the authentication to your bank account, so you, I have fewer opportunities to get your credentials, right? Because usually I don't pay with the credentials to access my bank account only to withdraw money. But next thing is, what you can configure as a service provider is a withdrawal limit. I can say you can only withdraw 
whatever, 10,000 Taiwanese dollars per day from a bank account into electronic money. Right? This is the same kind of security you usually apply to an ATM. If I take over your bank account, I can't go to the ATM and say, okay, please give me all the money in the account, unless you're a poor person. <laughs> that may work out, right? So that's another security thing where you can basically you, you limit the rate at the, of, of withdrawal. Right? So those are the two main things. Limit the rate of withdrawal, and of course reduce how often people disclose their credentials to improve security overall. But once I have gotten the money out of your bank account, yeah, top luck. Okay, I think yeah, I think it's, it's, in, it's almost the time. Yeah. Okay. Any any last questions for the for the, the toilet? Yeah. If now we are like ending the recording.